Well, good morning. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Just to have someone say good morning back. We have... <laughs> oh, my land. Uh, it's so good to be back. Praise God for this, hey? Um, it's been nice to have some outdoor services over the last couple of weeks. We've really enjoyed those. It's, it's good to be back in our building, though, too. We know that this isn't um, necessarily a holy place outside of God's spirit resting on each one of us. But it is nice to be back in our building, yes? Yeah. Um, just so you guys know, um, we don't have, we still don't have lyrics available for our services quite yet. We're not, um, we've been told not to encourage singing quite yet. We're hopeful that uh, soon we'll be able to do that. But um, we have a bunch of familiar songs, and we're just going to invite you guys to worship how you choose to worship, um, however that might be. We're going to open our service with a reading from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when when morning dawns. The nations rage and the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let's stand and worship. gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this I hope I hope my shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley he will lead. Oh, the night has been won and I shall. Sure, the price it has been paid for Jesus. 
we're grateful that you have brought us here and lord right now we just ask that you would fill our vision that our hearts would be even though we're um, limited on how we can worship that our hearts would be full and uh, full of you and your presence jesus that your holy spirit would rest on this place and that our eyes would just be stayed on you that our vision would be full of you everything else would become peripheral and uh, and secondary outside of our worship and our praise for you jesus we love you.
figure out why they're still emotional. And then I remembered, well, that's who I am, so why is anybody surprised by that? Uh, <coughs> I've been preaching all over the last couple of weeks, and I haven't been stuck like this in this moment. Um, I just missed everybody. relate a little bit to Nehemiah, who when the Israelites were scattered and sent into captivity, just longed to get back, but needed permission to do it, and needed to submit uh, to a foreign king in order to be able to bring the people back and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, and it didn't dawn on me until we were singing Be Thou My Vision, but that's kind of what, what we're doing. And um, I'm just so thankful that uh, you all came back. If you have a Bible, we're going to go to Psalm 103. I have lots of thoughts. And over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to share some of those thoughts with you. Um, in a crisis, people react. And we've been in a crisis, um, a global crisis, for the last 15, 16 months. And uh, we've all been reacting in, in any number of different ways. As we come out of the crisis, and as we see kind of the end of the crisis nearing, it's going to be very, very important for us to reflect. In a crisis, you react. After a crisis, you reflect. And so I've been doing a lot of that lately. Even as we've tried to navigate um, some of the new realities and, and just discover some different things uh, about, okay, what does it mean to get back to, to a new normal? I don't know if we'll ever be back to the old normal, and I don't know if we ever should go back to the old normal, but that's another sermon for another day. Um, as we get back into this, it's going to be, tempting for us to just kind of move on and move into it. But I think as Christians, it's going to be very, very important that we reflect, that we actually take some time and think, why did I react the way I reacted? Because here's what I think we're all going to conclude. If we reflect appropriately, is that we overreacted. We all overreacted. That the more distance, uh, the distance away from COVID comes in, we'll look back and say, man, why did we all freak out like we did? We're going we're gonna to see, I think, that we overreacted. And you're like, Ben, you're right. Those people who drive with their masks on, they overreacted, didn't they? That's not reflecting, that's judging. <laughs> Reflection is looking and saying, why did I react the way I did? What COVID brought about was a reminder of a few things. It, was, it reminded us of our mortality. That there are things in this world trying to kill us. It reminded us of our powerlessness. That there are authorities in the world that can exert power over our autonomy and our independence. It has shown us our entitlement those things that we found comforting, those things that we found joy and we found delight in, and, and those, many of those things were restricted. And that has made us feel three things, and this is really, really important, that we recognize these three primary human emotions. They've made us feel afraid, they've made us feel angry, and they've made us feel ashamed. Right? When we look and see, I've been reminded of more mortality, that should cause us to have a little bit of fear. When we see our powerlessness, it's only, it's only reasonable to respond a little bit angry. And when you see your entitlements and how deeply you want the things you want, some of us feel ashamed. Fear, anger, and shame. 
they have been brought kind of to the surface. They were always there. Fear, anger, and shame are always there. We all experience all three of those. We all experience one of those primarily, but we all feel all three and can relate to all three. They were always there. We just lost our coping and our control mechanisms that we had put in place in our lives pre-COVID that helped us manage them so they didn't take over our lives. But what COVID has done is it has exposed those things and we haven't had the same, the same different activities, behaviors, thought processes that we once did. And so it has left us on a spectrum of these emotions, swinging in this kind of polarized way. If you're, if you're fearful, you're, you may be cautious, you may be paranoid, right? You see that, you see that in people, right? We see this swing from, from being if you're on, on the angry side of things, annoyed to enraged, right? Annoyed to enraged. We, we feel, if we're on the same side, defensive about our entitlement and maybe even divided from other people, right? We've all experienced all of these different things. We've, it's left us feeling emotions that we don't really, really want to feel. Fear, anger, and shame are human emotions that God, God answers. In the gospel, we are told that we are given faith, hope, and love. Why? Because God knows we're afraid, angry, and ashamed. What's caused me great concern is that, is that not many people, not many Christians, have gone to the gospel to answer what they're feeling in this season. They've given themselves over, over to fear, anger, and shame, and, and, and it's caused a great deal of stress, division, heartbreak for all of us. Those who have persevered and will persevere through COVID and any other crisis are those who, in the midst of a crisis, go to God and receive faith, hope, and love instead of going to themselves and finding fear, anger, and shame. It's interesting how much of our lives, our decisions, and our behaviors are emotional. We are emotional creatures, and probably the majority of the things that we think, say, and do come from a place of emotion. That's why, over the next number of months, we thought it might be appropriate, as pastors, we thought it might be appropriate to explore explore proper responses to our emotions. And so we've entitled this series, Honest to God. And we're going to ask people in our church to become emotionally aware and emotionally honest before God. And we're going to do that by examining the Psalms. Because David and the other psalmists wrote from a place of redeemed emotion, and you know what they got in the midst of their crisis? Not necessarily resolution, but they got God. If we come out of COVID or any other crisis that we face in our life, and all we get is God, we're good. We're good. We don't need resolution as Christians. We don't need solutions as Christians. We don't need any of that because we have a living God, a powerful God who has invited us into a redemptive relationship so that by that we might have what we need to persevere on this broken earth with faith and hope and love. So that's what we're going to do over the next, probably through the summer and then when things open up uh, in September, um, we will figure out what the church looks like and pray about what we should do after that. But right now, we're going to spend some time going through uh, a, an emotional awakening by looking at the Psalms. Here's today's big idea. God can handle your emotions and encourage you with vulnerability. We're going to look at Psalm 103. As we do that, I uh, read this quote by John Calvin, who wrote maybe one of the top five most important systematic theologies ever. But what he wrote at the beginning as an introduction is really, really important, that he didn't want his systematic theology to be a means of, of coming to an intellectual agreement with God, 
rather this. He says, our wisdom consists almost entirely of two parts, the knowledge of God and of ourselves. But as these things are connected together by many ties, it is not easy to determine which of the true pr- two precedes and gives birth to the other. What he's saying is this, in order to find true wisdom, we need to know ourselves and we need to know God. But where do we look at first? Do we look to God first to understand ourselves or do we look at ourselves to understand God? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. And we're going to see a really great example of that today in Psalm 103. This is one of David's psalms, and most of his psalms are personal poetry inspired by the Holy Spirit, but this one is an invitation to worship. This would be a song that they would sing, and in a way, David is speaking for all of us. And so let's read it. Psalm 103, 1 through 5, and then uh, I'm going to pick up. uh, We're not going to get through the whole thing today, uh, but we'll, we'll read a bit more after that. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. I want to work through a couple of these verses just line by line. He begins, David does, by commanding his soul to bless the Lord. He gives himself some self-talk, right? He he, he's speaking to himself. He's not speaking to God. He's speaking to himself. He's saying, soul, worship God. Soul, humble yourself and bless God. This is the kind of self-talk we need, but it's not always the self-talk that we listen to. Everyone has an inner dialogue, right? We are all having these inner dialogues that are helping us manage our, our fear and our anger and our shame. We might say to our fear, what's the worst thing that can happen? Or we might say, but from our fear, it will never work out. We might say to our anger, being mad doesn't solve anything. Our anger might say to us, you have to fight for your rights. Our shame takes a hold of us, and we might say to it, don't be hard on yourself. Or our shame might tell us, you're so stupid. That's the inner dialogue that we're constantly battling. David steps back from his inner self and speaks to it and says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. It's so easy. It's so easy to participate in a a prayer relationship with God and even worship out of habit. It's easy to repeat amen without ever really speaking to God. It's easy to hear sermons without ever really listening to him. It's the spiritual lukewarmness that is a disease that exists within our world where being a Christian is a respectable thing. But if that's our condition, then we, like David, need to talk to ourselves. We have to start there. We need to stir our hearts to a more appropriate emotional response to the truth of God that we know. So David says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me. Bless his holy name all that is inside of me. How much of it? All of it. What's David saying? Feel. He's giving permission to feel. All those things that are inside of us. Think about what's inside of you. Thoughts, dreams, ambitions, insecurities, regrets, hurts, all that we're thinking and feeling. David is aware of his inner life. He sees his himself, and he's not threatened by it. He invites himself into the presence of God. Do you see it? He commands himself and then invites himself into the presence of God. All that is within me, bless his holy name. Why? Because he needed to be reminded of the benefits. That's what we read next, right? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And then he goes to describe those. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit. What does it mean to be in a relationship with God? It it means this, to have your iniquity forgiven, to have your diseases healed, to have your life redeemed from the pit. David knows this, that part of his soul, that shame-filled part, is going to need the benefit of forgiveness. How is our shame answered? It's through God's grace. What of our sin, how much of our sin can God handle? All of it. 
Jesus forgives all your iniquities, who heals all of your diseases. Those fears we have, right? You know, those threats to our mortality. What we need to be reminded of is that we need not fear those because God heals all of our diseases. And then says, and he redeems your life out of the pit. The pit was always the place of injustice in the Bible. Think Joseph. Remember Joseph, right? Who upset his brothers, annoyed his brothers, so they decided that they were going to throw him into a pit while they waited to sell him into slavery. For Joseph, the pit was this place of injustice. And while he was in the pit, what do you think he was feeling? Maybe a little bit too owed. He was probably angry. So David commands his soul to come into the presence of God in an emotional honesty so that he would hear from God how God answers those things, forgives all your diseases, he, uh, forgives all your iniquities, heals all of your diseases, redeems your life from the pit. These are the gospel truths that we all have in Christ. And when we forget the gospel, do you know what happens? We're susceptible to being controlled by our emotions to being dictated by fear, anger, and shame. That's one of the things that I think is a legitimate cause of concern coming out of COVID. We haven't had that rhythmic and ritual reminder of the gospel when on Sunday mornings we came to church. Therefore, we had to be far more intentional than intentional. That's not a word. Intentional about going to him, which, crazy thing, God has given us the Holy Spirit to worship him anywhere, in any time, in any place, by ourselves or with a congregation. God's worship is not threatened and was not threatened by COVID. And neither is our discipleship. Right? Most of all, what we see from these, just these few little verses, is that there is permission to feel and to come to God with our emotions. That's what David is telling himself and everybody else when he's leading them in this worship song. He enters the presence of God by the gospel. He does it by redeeming his self-talk. And, and he's neither denying his emotions or being controlled by his emotions. How did, how did David do this? Well, he was two things. He, was, he, he wasn't two things. He was neither emotionally closed closed or emotionally demanding okay david was not an emotionally closed person nor was he an emotionally demanding person in most of the psalms we see that he starts with theology okay which means that he's willing to go to god to have his heart changed to have his emotions changed some psalms begin with emotions but but leave hearing the truth David was one who was neither emotionally closed or, no, or emotionally demanding. But sometimes we are those things. People who are emotionally closed have trouble being okay with feeling. I think a whole generation in the church, in certain churches, was taught this. That if you feel something, you're exposing yourself to lies, Right? If we, if we allow ourselves to feel, then we might find ourselves falling into untruth. And the only safe thing to do was to become emotionally guarded and withdraw from our emotions and not feel things. Right? Anybody know of the generation of which I speak? Right? Those of you who are chuckling either relate or you know you have parents like this. Right? Well, we're not letting the young ones off the hook either. Right? They've swung the other way, where they're just emotionally, demand, uh, emotionally demanding, right? They feel it, and it must be validated, right? It's not, <laughs> they, they, they won't hear the truth. All they want is affirmation. You must accept me because of what I feel. They've gone swung this whole other way, right? Maybe in a generational reaction. I don't know, but that's what culture is doing, Okay. 
and, and instead of being able to hear the truth to bring out transformation of the emotional self, they are demanding that validation that gives them permission to feel whatever they want to feel regardless of whether or not it's true or the cause of it is true. David doesn't have that problem. Instead, he comes into the presence of God, honestly, he's not emotionally clothed, closed, I want to keep on saying clothed, clothed, he goes there, and then he stays there. You see it? He goes into the presence of God in emotional honesty, okay? So he's not going to be guarded, but he also has to stay there. And this is what the emotionally demanding people need to do. They need to stay there for a second and listen. And listen. Listen to God. And listen to God. what God might say. David is neither emotionally clothed or no emotionally demanding. And we need to be that way too. We need to enter into the presence of God by means of our emotions and then stay there. See, we come to God in this honesty, but we stay there to receive the truth. The truth about what? The truth about who God is. Verse 6. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all those who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. See, when we get into the presence of God and we're willing to stay there, what do we see? That God, God actually is working on our behalf. We don't need to validate our emotions. We need to trust God with our emotions. We enter in honestly and we leave trusting. Why? Did you notice at verse 9? He works justice for the oppressed. God is working justice for those who are the victims of injustice. When I'm angry, when I'm upset, what do I need to remember? God's angry too. But he has power to bring about justice, and he will. Therefore, I don't have the burden of my own anger anymore. God shows love to those who are afraid. Right? He shows compassion to his children. Compassion to those who fear him. The reason God commands us to fear God is so that we wouldn't be afraid of anything else. When we enter into the presence of God and see, and see that he is the greatest power in the whole universe, and that he would have every right and all the power to destroy me on the spot, and he doesn't, that both makes me afraid and love. And 1 John tells us that it's the perfect love of God that drives out all fear. God gives grace to the ashamed. He doesn't repay us according to our sins. Instead, he throws them as far as the east is from the west. Right? They're gone. When we come to God and we're feeling this deep sense of shame and, and, and our self-talk says, you know what, you just need to forgive yourself, God says to you, what, did, what are you talking about? It's gone. You don't need to forgive yourself. I already forgave you. You just need to believe that that's enough. Do you see what happens when we refuse to be emotionally closed and emotionally demanding? We go into prayer and we receive from the presence of God the promise of God, which brings about the power of God to change how we feel. We see that God validates our emotions but refuses to let us be victimized by our emotions. God himself is fearlessly loving, righteously angry, abundantly gracious, so we don't have to be controlled by those things. And instead, what we get is faith and hope and love. Do you see it? I hope you see it because it's really important. It's so important. Our world is dying for a vision of this. 
that this might be what God could do to bring about a revival, a change in people's lives through the season when we can say to them, yeah, I'm afraid. Yeah, I'm angry. Yeah, I'm feeling a bit of the shame of my entitlements as well. But I know a God, a God who both is angry, is forgiving, and is loving, and has told me that I don't bear the burden and the responsibility of trying to control my fear, anger, and my shame, then we're liberated. That's freedom. That's liberation. But we've got to be able to recognize the emotion and then enter, be willing to enter into the presence of God with our emotion and refuse to get caught up in the cultural winds of change that say you need to feed those things. And unfortunately, that has crept into the church. It's crept into the church. We're angry. We're upset. We're afraid of what what is this going to look like. And God keeps saying to us, my worship is not threatened, my church is not threatened, my mission is not threatened. And then... See, I have faith. God can be trusted. I have hope. God's got a plan. I've got love. He's going to take care of me. That's the power of our emotions. I think it's wonderful that in this passage, we don't see platitudes. We don't see this kind of get over it thing that we see God is trying to do. The other, the other day, I was ang- I've been angry a lot, so that's my thing. I don't know if you caught that or picked up on that. <laughs> You're like, aren't you a crier? Well, it's only my good times. And some days, it's just about, I've said this before, I'll say it again, cleaning your gun and reading Lamentations, right? You just, just get mad. And I go to God one day, and I was just, I was just mad. And I got lots of reasons to be mad, and they're all really good reasons. And then I stayed there for a minute. I didn't let my mind wander and go, that's really what I want to do, right? And I go to God and I'm angry. I want to have these kind of imaginary conversations with people, right? Where I'm totally destroying them with words and arguments. But I stayed there. And I heard God say, I'm angry too. And it did this profound work in my heart. Because I never thought he would be so mean. But our God is compassionate and he's empathetic and he understands. The Bible tells us that he knows and he knows. Over and over again, God knows our suffering. And God intends to do something about it not an intellectual thing, it's experiential for him. Jesus, when he was on the cross, cries, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I've derived derived a lot of comfort from those words of Jesus on the cross because I hear him angry and I hear him afraid and I hear him ashamed in those moments. And in this full honesty before God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? And then he says, into your hands I commit my spirit. He steps out on the cross and trusts God that God would deliver him and bring about a resurrection. And Jesus is the most perfectly emotionally honest person to ever have walked the face of the earth. And he was able to do it because he trusted God. Fourteen through nineteen we finish with this. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast fast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, 
to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Who should pray to God? Those who feel the futility of their humanity. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. On our bad days, so do we. On our good days, we forget. God always knows best. Who should pray to them? Those who feel their, the futility of their humanity. Who should praise him? Those who fear him and those who need him. When we're so in ourselves, we'll get more God. When we enter into the presence of God, we come face to face with ourselves. And this vulnerability is, is a good thing. It causes us to be vulnerable in the safest way and in the safest place possible. Because the vulnerability that we're feeling in those moments when we're in the presence of God does not exacerbate our fear, anger, and our shame. What, that's what happens when we're outside of the presence of God, but actually enhances it. And at the end of our emotions is more God. He's not asking you and I to conquer these things. He's inviting us to see him and trust him with those things. That's real prayer. Each week as we share a song with you, and by we, the pastors who are preaching, wherever it is they're preaching, we're going to invite you to pray the psalm through the week. And I want to challenge you to do that this week, to pray Psalm 103 this week. And so I've got seven points of how to pray this psalm. Did I, I thought the sermon was over. Quickly, command your body, right? In order to get to the place where you can command your soul, you have to first command your body. The reason many of us aren't praying is not because we're physically unable to, it's because we emotionally don't want to. It's not a physical problem, it's an emotional problem. So we need to command our body to have control over our emotions. Then we need to command our soul. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. We need to speak to ourselves. We need to do so, number three, in emotional honesty. When he says, all that is within me, bless his holy name, he says, say, he's giving you permission to say to God, God, I'm angry, I'm afraid, and I'm ashamed. Number four, ask. Ask for one of the benefits for forgiveness, healing, and redemption. Pray that to the one who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit. And then remind yourself, number five, of the truth of who God is, that he is like us, but unlike us, like us in that he understands our emotions, unlike us in the fact that he's actually able to redeem us and conquer those things. See the cross. Okay, the reason that he doesn't deal with us according to our sins nor repay us according to our iniquities is because Christ dealt with those things on our behalf. Number six. Number seven, lead in confidence that your humility has been met by God's glory. That last verse that we read, it's not the last verse of the psalm, but number 19, it says this, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. And as we live in the world, believing that his kingdom has come and is coming, we do so understanding that he is in control of all things, that he is the greatest authority in the universe, and he loves us. That, my friends, when you believe that, is All it takes is looking at the cross and seeing the God of all grace who's slow to anger, abounding in love, took on the pain of the cross so that we could be restored to know God and be known by Him. It's in the cross that we see our fear, anger, and our shame are resolved. And it's at the cross where we enter into a relationship with the Father who is willing to give us faith, hope, and love in order to do it. So today, this Sunday morning, let's not, let's not forget all those benefits. Let's forget our shame with it. These wonderful inventions show us that technology can actually serve God. You can peel off the top one there. And take out the bread. For all of you who are believers in the gospel of Jesus Christ and trust in him and him alone for salvation, let us all take a moment and reflect on the broken body of Jesus, broken for each one of us so that we can be made whole.
of sleep, and then you think of the other. Sleep carries your thoughts, your thoughts carry your sleep. Jesus is saying this in my body, working through me, through all of us here. declaration of covenant relationship with us. What we hold in our hands is all of the promises of God. And what we see in the cross is that the promises came true. God upholds his covenant because he is faithful to himself. And we get the benefit. For God to break his word would be for him to betray his own goodness. So when Jesus passed away on the cross, and this is a new covenant in our day, we are saying, God will fulfill all of the things that he has promised. Let us think and remember that and confess our unbelief and our acceptance in our mind.
A strong and perfect plea, great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and bends for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart. I know that while in him he stands, no tongue can be. The great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with himself I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is in with Christ on high. For Christ my Savior. Everything's changing really fast. I forgot to prepare a benediction because I don't, I don't really know what's going on some days. But we got a good team around us, and I trust all of them. And uh, I just want to say thank you for coming to church today, and not just for coming, but for also adhering and doing the things that we're asking you to do, so that we can we can do this. Um, hope to come back next week, and the week after that, and the week after that, and let others know how good it is to be back. Leave you with some words out of Hebrews, if I can remember them. Don't throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, because you need endurance, so that after you've done God's will, you will receive what has been promised to you. For in yet a very little while, the coming one will come and will not delay. But the Lord says, my righteous one will live by faith, and if he draws back, I have no pleasure in him. For we are not those who draw back and are destroyed, but those who have faith and are saved. God bless you. Thanks for coming.